welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. I'm Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TC Jew Folk. This week, I talk with Elisa Burnick, whose newest book, Departure Stories, Betty Crocker Made Matzo Balls and Other Lies, is out on October 4th. We talk about her career in journalism, how long this memoir has been in the works, and why this was the time to confront some of the things she chose to on this week's Who the Folk podcast. Alisa Burnick, welcome to the Who the Folk podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. You are a, you, or you have been a journalist. You have been a writer. You are an author. Your latest book comes out in just a couple of days, October 4th. Yep. The new book, Departure Stories, Betty Crocker Made Matzo Balls and Other Lies. <laughs> so, I love the title. It caught me right away. It seems really fun. I guess for starters, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book and where it came from? All right, I can do that. Um, it essentially has lots of heavy themes in it, tackled with a great deal of humor. So as we're speaking, it may sound like, ooh, but actually there's tons of humor and Jewish jokes throughout this entire book. So I just want to preface our conversation by saying that. Um, where it came from is I, like many people, had a very difficult family growing up. And in particular, my mom, she was a pistol. <laughs> uh, she was a kind of a redheaded Samson that took the walls of our family down eventually. But um, she was also creative and intelligent and one of the first Jewish women to compete in the Mrs. Minnesota pageant in 1964. Uh, she, she was really something. But on top of that, she was uh, a very angry, uh, sad, conflicted, difficult person to be around. So the, the early genesis of this book came out of me trying to understand what the heck was she so angry about? And, uh, and that is my journey. Um, you mentioned my background as a journalist. I am a working journalist still. And I initially wrote this book as a novel, as many memoirs do, mm -hmm. because uh, that gives us a little cover, gives us a little distance. We don't have to really dig into the hard stuff. But um, I actually um, won a chance to work with a published writer through this AWP program called Writer to Writer. And we got into the book and we were 100 pages in and she said, Elisa, this is terrific. But if a suicide, murder, or drug overdose doesn't happen within the next 25 pages, it's not a novel. It's a memoir. You need to rewrite it. <laughs> oh, no. I know. It was just like, oh. I was that's really that's so much work. It's so much work. And and not even rewriting. It's the, the internal work, right? Mm. I mean, that's really what I've been afraid of doing, all that internal work. But it was a really good bit of advice. So I, I rewrote it, but I could use a lot of what I'd already done in the mm -hmm. novel because there was a great deal of research there already. And I ended up ultimately writing a part memoir, part social history. Okay. Uh, the journal, yeah, the journalist in me wanted to explore my mother's experience set against a wider backdrop. What was going on? during her early childhood, what was going on when she became a mother in the context of what was going on in Minnesota, mm -hmm. what was going on in the country. Um, and so basically I use my family to explore how Jews got to Minnesota, how Jews uh, eventually were considered white enough to move out to the suburbs in the 1950s and 60s. And I use uh, my family story to explore anti-Semitism, reinvention, intergenerational trauma. Like I said, it's going to sound like a really heavy book, but it's really not. Okay. Yeah, because like, I'm still waiting for you to touch on the fun parts because it all seems <laughs> very, it all seems very heavy right now. Now, <laughs> that said, I'm sure it felt fairly therapeutic going through the exercise mm. and putting this together. It did feel therapeutic indeed. Uh, it, 
you know what? It, okay. So this is what I come away with. And, and I have to say, many writers have said this in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. but you don't become the person who can tell this story until you've written the story. Right. So I didn't start out understanding lots of this stuff. I came out understanding lots of this stuff. So the main lesson I came out with was rather than spending so much time demonizing my mother, I decided to humanize her. Mm. And that unlocked a door that had trapped us both in some little story that told a very negative, it was a one note negative story. Okay. And by just sort of opening it up, I cracked open myself and her. And it made for a much more interesting, funny, nuanced exploration of her life and the life of Jews here in Minnesota. Why You're still waiting he... for me to get to the funny bits, aren't I'm you? not. I'm not. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure we will. I, I I have confidence in that. I'm curious sort of about the timing of, of the book. Why now, you know, it's sort of this point in your life, did you want to take this retrospective look back at your mother and your childhood? Okay. That's a really good question. Well, there's a couple of things. One, I don't know if you remember, but back in 2016, a book came out called a Good Time for Truth, Race in Minnesota. And that was put out by the Histor Minnesota Historical Society Press, okay? okay? And in it, it it basically was 16 essays of people of color um, giving their perspectives of being in Minnesota and being different, mm -hmm. okay? There were no Jewish voices in that book. But I recognized my experience as a Jew throughout that book. I kept thinking, hey, that's how I felt. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Growing up in New Hope in the 1960s and 70s, I totally had that experience, but I wasn't, I was considered white, mm -hmm. I was, but I'm Jewish and nobody else around me was. So that was one reason. And the second reason is once you become a mom and I have two kids, uh, the whole thing about reducing your own mother to, to some sort of one note story just doesn't work anymore. Because I don't, are you a parent? I am. I have okay. uh, two, two teenage girls. Okay. So you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. right? I'm sure you've examined your own parents um, in a different way once you are a parent, right? So, right? Yeah, yes, right? absolutely. Absolutely. So as I started parenting and also getting older, I started looking in the mirror and seeing my mother more and more. And it started to bother me that my first impulse was to go, oh, oh, dear. Oh, bummer. Right. It was, an, it, was it was like, oh, I'm turning into my mother. And that was a very bad thing to me. But but that just started to feel icky on so many levels. Like I wanted to to find the joy in my own mothering, in my own self and not, frankly, pass down lots of negative stuff that I got growing up to my own children. So this was a big part of, of uh, my impetus in, in, yeah, looking at my mom, looking at my family, trying to get a larger, more nuanced view. And it's not to say that those things aren't there, but it, 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 it don't take this the wrong way. It, it sort of feels very cliche in, in a way, not, and I don't think that's unique to you. I think that's a lot of people who are parents who are examining, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to turn out like my mother. I don't want to turn out like my father. And it just feels like, you know, yeah, I think we sort of have a tendency to find the worst, uh, the worst impulses of them as parents. And oh, yeah, I, I think oh. there's a, there's a great possibility that maybe we're not remembering our own childhoods all that accurately, perhaps. And and that's an interesting thing that you talk about, because in the book, I spend considerable time talking about memory. Mm. the nature of memory, the authenticity of memory, the truth, the so-called truth of memory. And I do delve um, not, not in a, you know, sort of in-depth uh, bore you to tears way, but I look at the science of mm. memory and brains. Yeah. And I don't know how you grew up thinking about memory, but I grew up thinking about it like, oh yeah, just call up these 
files, these static snapshots shots of time. And they just exist like that eternally. And that is absolutely wrongheaded. Every time we bring up a memory, we change that memory and then we tuck it back in. So we're not remembering the memory of 25, 30 years ago. We're remembering the last time we thought about this memory (laughs) and then we change it again. Right. So when I started, you know, and I talked to my siblings about their memories and how, what did it, right. I start to realize, wait a minute. uh, Are, are they misremembering? Am I misremembering? misremembering. And one of the most fascinating things was, remember, I told you that this started as a novel. Right. And I wrote a story that I thought was complete fiction, total fiction, thought I was totally making it up. And my sister, Lori, read this story in the novel. And she said, yeah, you didn't make this up. That's what happened. (laughs) I I knew that was where I knew that was the punchline. I knew exactly where you were going with that. So, so not only do we misremember our what we think is true, right? I totally thought something was one hundred percent false, and it was true, right? You know, I, I so, think it's memory and its perceptions of of incidents and what is real, what is not, and it, but it doesn't really matter because it's the perception of it that is what drives the narrative going forward for you. You are absolutely right. And and as a nonfiction writer, we're always really careful to talk about, oh, we want to be truthful. And we do. Yeah. We don't want to mislead readers, right? Absolutely. But really, all we can do is do our best to get at the emotional truth of a situation. Yeah. And I say this because my book mixes a lot of different kinds of content. I already mentioned there's lots of Jewish jokes in there. There's lots of Minnesota, Lena and Oli jokes. There's... Uh, there's a recipe, a Betty Crocker recipe in there. There's, um, but there's also a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of scene in okay. there. So it reads that that's some of the stuff I grabbed from my novel. Okay. And because those were actually conversations that I remember. Now, could I possibly really remember a conversation verbatim when I was seven years old? No, no, I certainly cannot. But I can give you the emotional truth of that conversation. Absolutely. And that's what I do. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's such a fascinating, you know, dare I say almost like psychological experiment that what this book is in terms of, you know, just the the memory and psyche and probably a little bit, you you use generational trauma. And I know that's something that gets talked about. I I think a lot in the Jewish community, it's something we face all the time. And all of these things sort of are coming, uh, are are, are part of this story. Absolutely. And you asked where, where did this come from? Why now? Right. Well, we're all having conversations about being seen. Right. Like like having our experiences seen and uh, trying to give people our authentic experiences to help inform them and also make ourselves feel seen and heard. And a big part of my growing up in the Twin Cities uh, in New Hope, Minnesota, was Jew being Jewish. I was not seen. I was disappeared. Because everybody else was a Christian, a white Christian. Right, yeah. And it was very interesting. I've had this experience at the the JCC, where I belong, and I work out there in the winter. And I've had this bizarre Pavlovian response on the treadmill where, okay, so I don't watch TV very often, but I kind of reward myself when I'm working out that I I watch the Food Network, okay? Which is ironic, right? A little bit, a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> burning calories so, while dreaming of eating the things that they're making. Sure. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so there was a commercial frequently on. And as far as I don't even know if it's still on, but it maybe it's 15 seconds long. There I am on the treadmill at the J and you're, you're shown a large room of college graduates. It's a very diverse group of college graduates. And they're got the guy up on the podium, the Dean or whatever is saying, 
Stand up if you're a military veteran. Stand up if you're a single mom. Stand up if you right. It's all about yeah. seeing and being acknowledged. Every single time I was on the treadmill, I am crying. I'm looking around going, this is very odd. Oh, I hope no one's looking at me. Why is this happening? Every single time. And I realized it's because being Jewish in Minnesota is being invisible in many ways. Mm -hmm. I know. I I don't know where you grew up, but in, in New Hope, I never saw Judaism reflected anywhere, except when I went to the Bethel Synagogue in St. Louis Park which was a 15 minute schlep, right? Right. Or 15 mile schlep. Um, but it was reflected nowhere in the larger culture. I mean, Rugrats was, thir- you know, 30 years in the future. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if that's your cultural touchstone, I mean, yes, I think there are some other We're issues to diagnose yeah, right. there. Yeah. You know, I mean, the closest we got was Hermie, the, <laughs> the dentist, right? In Rudolph. Yeah. And how could Hermie not be a member of our tribe? It's right. impossible. Right. Um, but that was it. And just sort of, or, you know, having people say, when they find out you're Jewish, oh, you don't look Jewish. Right. <laughs> Being like, now, how is that a compliment exactly? Because that's a bad thing to, to look like who I am? Or, right. It doesn't mean quite what people, those people think, who think say that means. think it means. Right. 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 So, so the book kind of muses about this in a ironic way, in a humorous way, but it's also getting at some stuff about anybody who's Jewish or not Jewish, right. Who is perceived as different. Right. And how we deal with difference. Right. And I think sort of the idea of, of othering and being othered is, is being, I think, discussed more and more and is is sort of out there in the conversation more and more. So I think that it's something that obviously there's the Jewish undertones throughout the story, but it it's clearly a sort of overarching topic yeah. that that crosses lines regardless of, you know, where you're from. Absolutely. You don't have to be Jewish to have much of the material resonate. The, you know, I use that as um, my own personal sort of othered. That's how I was othered. But we are all othered in a lot of ways. And a big part of this book discusses surrendering stories that don't serve us anymore yeah. and reinventing stories that serve us better. And I think we are all doing that in a lot of different ways. I think so, too, because I think we're sort of realizing that we get to be our own narrators. Exactly. We get to tell our own story. We don't have to just follow the narrative that somebody else sets for us. Yes. And and I think for me, for many, many years, I I didn't feel like I was the author of my own family story. Interesting. And that has been a very empowering thing to understand that I was placing myself in a particular role that diminished me and diminished my mother. And that by allowing our story to be larger, that I could be larger and so could she. Yeah. Yeah. So this is your second book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. There aren't a lot of, I, I've written no books, so I, this is not a statement that's meant to judge, but there aren't oftentimes where uh, an author will write two books with a 15 year gap <laughs> in between them. Oh, Lonnie, thank you so much for bringing that up. <laughs> so, so your first book was the family sabbatical handbook. Um, right. The Budget Guide to Living Abroad with Your Family. H- have you revisited the book recently to see sort of how well it holds up 15 it years It holds later? up very well. Does it? it holds Interesting. Up. Okay. Yeah, it really does. Because now, it's going to seem like passe now, but 15 years ago, nobody was moving abroad with their kids and nope. living and no, no. So my husband and I moved with our two very young children to Mexico. Okay. We didn't speak Spanish. We knew nobody. <laughs> Just big adventure. And uh, interestingly, that's when I first started the novel for this 
this present really book, weird. I know. Super. So this weird. is so, okay. So this new book really is like a decade and a half plus in the making. Yes. Okay. Yes. If you go back to its earliest genesis. Intr- yes. All right. Really cool. Okay. Yes. Um, so, but we lived in Mexico for almost two years and I wrote a book about, I interviewed tons of other families actually all around the world, okay. um, about how they did it because it was just a really new thing to go on a family sabbatical as I call it. Yeah. Um, and it was very hard back then cause you didn't have the internet like you do now. You really had to step outside of your comfort zone mm-hmm. in a different way. You have to we, we didn't know the language. We had to learn that. Our kids were immersed in Mexican schools. So I wrote a how-to, essentially, and, okay. and used our family's experience and interviewed a ton of people to talk about that. But yes, in the intervening years, um, I'm a journalist, so I did a lot of article writing and, and sure. all of that. And I did some documentaries, long form uh, television documentaries in the intervening years as well. But no, I did not uh, really get it together to get a book going until, as I said, you know, about eight years ago, really. Okay. So what can I tell you? It takes me a long time. That's okay. Listen, they take, they take how long they take. You, they know, do. you can't, you can't rush these. You can't rush these things. And I will tell you one other thing that it was a lot easier uh, emotionally on everybody for me to wait a little bit until, uh, I got this published. I do really get down into the nitty gritty of, of some deep family stuff. And it's helpful that a couple of the people, including my mother, uh, are no longer with us. Mm. Not that I think she would, I think she would have enjoyed this being published. Okay. And I think it, I think it really would have, she would have been proud, very, very proud. Um, but emotionally it would have been challenging for her and, uh, and challenging for me to have her around. So it Do was think, best for everybody. No, it's, that's fair. Do you think some of the things that you, you, you wrote about, maybe some of the conclusions you, you came to, even if they didn't make, the final edition of the book, but things at least in your head, do you think as your, your mother got older and, and as you got older, that some of those notions may have altered because of time? Of course. Okay. Of course. Yes. Um, I mean, if I'm taking your question, right, you know, both, my ability to see a larger story, my ability to write a deeper, more nuanced story, my interest in, as I mentioned, humanizing rather than demonizing, all of that develops and developed for me as I parented, as I found myself growing older, as I had a greater desire to be kinder (laughs) as a human being, okay, to both myself and others in the world, all of that grew in importance over time. I don't think I could have written this story until I was able to write this story. And I think the kind of introspection that, that had to go into something like this can't be rushed. Oh, no. And you got to face it when you're ready to face it. Oh, right. And I mean, with any memoir, the reality is you have to know what not to include, right? You have to understand the story you're really going to tell to universalize it, to make it interesting, to make it a story worth telling that will resonate with other people. That's part of the point. If it's just going to be you know, sort of a, that's a, that's an autobiography. If Mm. all I'm going to do is, well, this happened and this happened and this happened. No, I was interested in why and what about our culture and what was happening during this period to my family, to other families. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and it's a very journalistic way of looking at it. I mean, it sort of comes back to the, the, the heart of, of who you are as a professional. It is. And, and really, I'm not sure 
I ultimately could have found a better way than to sort of put on my journalist hat a lot Mm -hmm. of the time and try to give some kind of fair, fairer look at what was going on. And that really cracked open the story for me. Yeah. So you've done lots of journalistic work. You, you've done TV work. You've done essays. You've, you know. I worked for Minnesota Public Radio as a reporter and producer when I first started out years ago. Yep. Okay, so so you've, you've worked in a lot of different mediums. Which do you personally enjoy the most? <laughs> oh, they're all so different. <laughs> they are all so different, which is really interesting to me because it's a kind of professional diversity that you don't often see journalistically. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Okay, I will tell you that the the thread that ties all my work together is the writing. It always comes back to that. But I am a very visual learner. And even when you read this book, I paint paint very intricate pictures. I, I am really, it's like a movie. That is how I write. And that's how I think. And I, that's why it will grab you and you, it will really uh, hang on to you. And, and there's, there's a saying when you write is you keep your hands on the reader at all times. Mm-hmm. And, and that's very much when I'm doing it, I am, we are watching a movie together. <laughs> we're, we're all at that dinner table together. <laughs> <laughs> so I have enjoyed every bit of it. I, I loved being in radio. It was super fun. Um, Doing documentaries was great because I got to interview so many interesting people, but it's always the writing that that's really the piece that I come back to. So I, I guess I got to say that, you know, it's, it's the printed word. It's the typing. It's the experience of getting deep down in my own head and just being with all these thoughts and my own curious self and writing to understand something. That is excellent. So the book comes out in a couple of days, October 4th. Where can people find it? You can find it at all the usual places. If you want to buy it locally, I would encourage you to go to Next Chapter Books in St. Paul. They are um, ordering the book. They're interested in having people pick it up from them. Um, I will be doing a number of events around town to be announced So you can also, of course, come to these events and buy the book from me. But you can go online, you know, Amazon, any of those places, if that's where you prefer to buy it or one of your online independent booksellers, too. And I know the first sort of big festival thing you you have up on your Facebook page, uh, the Twin Cities Book Festival on October 15th at the State Fairgrounds. You are taking part of that. Yep. Yep. I'm going to do some weird thing that I haven't gotten any information. (laughs) Fantastic. <laughs> Gonna hopefully, be pitching the book somehow. Hopefully, listen, hopefully they'll tell you what the what what the shtick is before you get there. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh well, last couple questions and we're gonna let you go. Uh yeah. first, what is your favorite Jewish holiday? Passover, of course. Stories. Oh. Stories. I was gonna ask why, but yeah, that seems very obvious. Food. Food. Yeah, that too. Uh <laughs> And what is, speaking of food, what is your favorite Jewish food? Latkes. Okay, how come? You know, there's a lot of different ways to make latkes. And of course, I love the traditional way Mm -hmm. that we made growing up. But I really like sweet potato latkes too now. Mm -hmm. So we make a lot of different kind of latkes in our house. Are are you an applesauce or sour cream person? Both. I do both, 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 both. Always both. Even on sweet potato latkes. They're really good with sour cream and applesauce. All right. Well, that is excellent. Elisa Burnick, uh, the book Departure Stories comes out October 4th. Thank you so much for joining me and best of luck with the launch. Thank you so much, Lonnie. I appreciate it. The Who the Folk podcast is part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network, a product of Jew Folk Inc. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you have suggestions for other podcast guests, please email them to me at editor at tcjewfolk.com. For our other shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. Podcast.